All right, let's open our Bibles. First Kings chapter two, verse 12. First Kings chapter two, verse 12. Last week, if you were with us, we are currently going through the historical books of the Old Testament. They are written in narrative form. We have told you quite often, but it always bears repeating that when you are in the narrative books of the, of the New Old Testament or of the, the New Testament, especially the Gospels, that the best way you can learn as you read the stories is to stand next to the individuals. Ask yourself, what would I do? What would I say? How would, would I approach this situation? Because narrative literally means to tell a story. Sometimes you'll read these stories and you go, man, Lord, I wish I knew more. And you don't get more. And so the Lord goes, this is what I want you to learn from. This is all you got to go on. Other times you read and you go, that's more than I want to know. And then you got to say, Lord, what do I, am I supposed to learn here? And so we are in the midst now of, of uh, the historical books. We have ended last time at the first couple of ver uh, verses of chapter 1 and then chapter 2 to verse 11, the life of David. Um, tonight we begin the reign of his son, Solomon, the third a king that Israel had after Saul and, and David. Solomon is, is the, the, the son of Bathsheba. He is, like I said, Israel's third and last king under a united kingdom. Uh, and we get to see what God gave to him um, and what he had to take on as a young man. In fact, Solomon was about 19 years old when he became king. Imagine that, having a 19-year-old king over you. He would rule for 40 years he, he would begin in about 971 B.C., die about 931 B.C. We are given very little of Solomon's life by comparison to David, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Really, far less. We have some books that he wrote, so that helps us. But in, in terms of the, the, the narrative or the history, we get 20 chapters about. And then half of them are, are dedicated to what it took to build the temple rather than dedicated to Solomon himself. So we have a little bit to go on and we'll try to draw out as much as we can. As with J David, when we mentioned David when we began, the, the books of Chronicles, which follow the books of Kings, look back to give us some further information about Solomon. If you read the first eight chapters of Second Chronicles, you will get a little bit more of an understanding of who is, uh, Solomon is. However, you should know that like the book of, or, or like the chapter of Hebrews 11, where the Lord writes down the faithfulness of, of those that you can read all about in the Old Testament, you see them warts and all there, but when you get to where God's grace is and he only picks the things that are of faith and pleasing, you get to only hear the good things. If you read 2 Chronicles chapters 1 through 8, you will read only good things of Solomon. There are no improprieties there, no weaknesses of character there. It is the heavenly father who, who writes from the, with the grace that he looks upon his son. And, and it, is, it is really the, the Romans chapter 8, no condemnation to those who are in Christ. That's really what you read there. So we're going to get warts and all here. But when you get to Second Chronicles, you're going to get a report about the goodness of God and the eyes of God looking at his son in grace. Um, Solomon has, if you weren't with us recently, survived recently the attempt, a coup attempt by his brother Adonijah. And he recently went through the mourning for the death of his father David, who anointed him to be king. Tonight we're going to get an overview of his early reign. We're going to try to get through to chapter 4. I think we'll be all right. He is tested early on by deceit, by threat. He is established as king by the nation and seeks God's wisdom to rule. And you are given in these chapters kind of God's report of how the, the, the nation of Israel was doing. It's almost like God's state of the state address. Here is how they were doing. Here's how they were faring, how the nation was doing spiritually. Let's start at verse 12, chapter 2. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, he came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, and she said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably. Remember, this is the fellow that just led the coup, another son of David's. Moreover, he said, I have something to say to you. And she said, say it. He said, you know that the kingdom was mine, that all of Israel had set their expectation upon me. However, the kingdom has been turned over and has become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. Now, again, Adonijah, another son of David, he's a half-brother to Solomon. 
um, now goes to Solomon's mom to try to enlist her help, her favor, by asking for some favors because he said, I should have been the king. You know everybody wanted me, but the Lord had other ideas. But understand, Adonijah doesn't have other ideas. He could care less about what God thinks. It showed in the way that he went about, you know, trying to take the kingdom, if you will. But in terms of descendancy, or if you will, in birth order, he was the fourth, fourth born, son, uh, born son to David, uh, Amnon, Chiliab, Absalom, and now this guy. So if he got the family tree out, he might go, you see, I'm next. That's true, but God has a choice here. And God had made his choice. And notice from verse 15 that he knew it. From his own mouth, he says this, rightfully mine, but God gave it to somebody else. I, I, I stand in line to be the next successor, but God had other plans. And I have all of Israel's support. Well, if you remember with us last week, he got the support of the high priest, Abiathar. He got the support of Joab, who uh, was David's nephew, was also the, the head of the army. Um, that didn't work. It fell apart. God had other ideas. So he comes to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and says, you kind of owe me a favor because I let Solomon have his way. Well, really? Go back and read what we just did last week. He just couldn't get it together. But needless to say, he felt like there's no way a son could refuse a request from his mother, and here's what he wants. Verse 19, Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon. Oh, sorry, I skipped a little bit. Uh, verse 16, uh, here's one petition that you could ask. Please don't deny me. And she said, say it. And he says, please speak to King Solomon. He will not refuse you. Ask him that I might take Abishag, Abishag the Shunammite, as a wife. And Bathsheba said, very well, I'll speak to him for you, to the king. And so uh, he went to ask, or, or she went to ask, therefore, to King Solomon to ask about this request. And the king rose up to meet her, bowed down to her, and sat down on his throne, and had a throne, and sat for the king's mother. And so she sat down in his right hand. Um, it is an interesting request that, Saul, uh, that Adonijah offers to the, to the, to the mother. A um, couple of things. Number one, if you know the Lord has other ideas, but you're not willing to agree with them, you're in a bad position anyway. And this young man was absolutely not in a place of, of, of wanting to serve the Lord at all. Second of all, he's asking for this woman's in marriage if you were with us last week, this is a woman, beautiful young woman, that the servants of David found in his old age who would be able to serve him kind of as his personal maid and even lay in the bed with him to keep him warm. We talked last week about how bad of an idea that might have been. But she was faithful, and the word makes it real clear. She, there was everything on the up and up. But now this boy wants to marry um, this woman that had taken care of David for the last part of his life. It, it is tantamount to saying... I want the kingdom. That's literally what he's doing. You might remember that when uh, Absalom tried to overthrow his father, he took several of his father's concubines and he slept with them up on the roof in the, in the full view of the, of the people to say, you know, I'm the Lord here, you're not. And it was just that, that it's a wicked kind of worldly practice that was certainly practiced in those days to say, who's in charge? Uh, I am. I think Bathsheba was absolutely unaware of what this meant. Because she said, I'll just go ask. I, I have no idea. This doesn't seem to be something. She, oh, that's not going to work. She doesn't seem to have a reaction to it at all. So she goes to King Solomon, her son, verse 19. He sets up a throne for her next to him on his right hand. And she said, I, I, I have a desire, a, a small petition for you. Please don't refuse me. And he said, ask mom. <laughs> I won't refuse you. And she, she said, could you let Abishag, the Shuamite, be given to Adoniah, your, it would be your half-brother, as his wife? And Absalom in, answered and said to his mother, now, do you ask for Abishag, for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also. He is my older brother. For him and for Abiathar the priest and for Joab, the son of Zeruiah, in other words, all of these conspirators, 
And Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, May God do so to me, and more, if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. So therefore, as the Lord lives, who has confirmed me to sit on the throne of David my father, and who has established a house for me, as he promised, Ab Adonijah shall be put to death today. And King Solomon sent by the hand of this fellow Bananai, the son of Jehoiada, and he struck him down, and he died. Solomon was very clear about what was going. He understood clearly what the request meant. Um, it was tantamount to claiming the th throne and all. Um, And Solomon makes it clear, you, you might as well just ask for the kingdom. I mean, it's the equivalent to just handing it over. So this coup leader was not going to stop, and so he had to be stopped. And the Lord had a man there who was going to take over the army for Solomon, this fellow Benaiah, and he went and dealt with this man, and he died. And he got killed. And to Abiathar, verse 26, the priest, the king said, Go to Anathoth, to your own fields, for you are deserving of death, but I will not put you to death at this time because you carry the ark of the Lord before my father David and because you were afflicted every time my father was afflicted. So you showed some compassion. So Solomon removed Abiathar, uh, being the priest of the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord which he had spoken concerning the house of Eli at Shiloh. Now again, you know, learning your Bible, back in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Eli was a fellow that, that hadn't restrained his sons, had, had brought disrespect and shame to the priesthood, to the high priest uh, position. And the Lord, in judging him, said um, that he would remove every descendant from his life from ever sitting there and serving in the priesthood. Now, this is years later, but this is the last guy. This is the last guy in that family of Eli. And so it fulfills the word that God spoke to him years later. Verse 28, then, came to, then the news came to Joab, and Joab had also defected to Adonijah, that he had not defected, though he hadn't defected when Absalom had led his coup. So Joab, hearing the news that, that you know, he's been found out, fled to the tabernacle of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. But Solomon, the king, said, jo Joab has fled to the tabernacle of the Lord. There he is by the altar. And, and jo uh, Solomon said to his new leader of his army, go strike him down. And so Ben and I went to the tabernacle of the Lord and he said to him, thus saith the Lord, come out. He said, no, I'll die here. And Ben and I brought back the word to the king saying, he, this is what Joab said, he's gonna die here. And then the king said, do as he's asked. Just strike him down right there. Bury him there that he may take away from me and from my father's house the innocent blood which he has shed. And so the Lord, uh, so the Lord went, will return his blood upon his head because he has struck down two men more righteous than he. He killed them with the sword. Abner, the commander of the army of Israel. Amasa, the son of Jether, the commander of the house of Judah. Uh, of the, the armies of Judah, though my father didn't know it, their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab, upon the head of his descendants forever, but upon David and his descendants and upon his family, his house and his throne, there shall be peace forever from the Lord. And so Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, went up, struck and killed him. He was buried in his own house there in the wilderness. And the king put Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, in the place over the army. And he then also put Zaok, the priest in the place of Abiathar, who had been kind of told to stay in town but not have anything to do with the priesthood. So if you were with us last week when David was dying, David said to his young son, besides anything about walking with the Lord, which was his most important uh, word to him, he said, look, there's an awful lot of guys in this kingdom that I've let live that probably need to go. You know, folks that you can't trust, folks that have hurt us, Joab was a fellow that had killed um, several folks without David's permission. In fact, they were not faithful to David, but David said, just forgive him. Let us let, let this go. And he had decided to not let those things go. Uh, the time had come to deal with the insurrection, David said, and, and Solomon calls for him to stand. He, he wanted to have him come and, and, and be spoken to. He refused. So he killed him there hanging upon the horns of the altar, where according to the Old Testament, if you were innocent, you could run for mercy. 
If you were innocent, you could hang on to the altar where the Lord, you know, sacrifices to the Lord were being made outside the, the, ta- the tabernacle, and you could get a fair trial before whatever happened to you happened to you. But if you were guilty, and man, was this guy guilty, there was no hiding and there was no, there was no escape. So this wicked killer, and that's who Joab was, you know, th- tried to hide behind religious externals, but he was unrepentant, and he had been sowing for years what he had been sowing. He was a cold-blooded murderer. When David showed grace, he would not. And so he was taken out. Adonijah, taken out. Joab, taken out. Abiathar, exiled uh, to stay where he was supposed to stay. So uh, Solomon replaced the high priest, replaced the head of his army. And then we have one more guy here in verse 36. The king then sent and asked for a fellow named Shammai and said to him, I want you to go build a house in Jerusalem and stay there and do not go out from there. But if, for it is, it shall be on the day that you go out and cross the Kidron Brook. Know for certain that you shall surely die. Your blood will be upon your own head. And so Shammai said to the king, that's a good saying, as my lord the king has said, so your servant will do. So Shammai dwelt in Jerusalem many days, but it happened at the end of three years that two slaves of Shammai ran away. They ran to Achish, who was in Gath. And they told Shammai about it and said, look, your slaves are now in Gath. And so Shammai got on a donkey and headed that way to seek out slaves. And Shammai went and he brought his slaves back. But Solomon had been told that he had gone from Jerusalem and now had come back from Gath. And the king sent and said to Shammai and said to him, didn't I tell you and make you swear by the Lord and warn you that the day that you go out and travel anywhere, you're surely going to die? And and you said to me, that was a good word. Well, then why didn't you keep the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I gave you? The king shall said moreover to him, you know as your heart acknowledges the wickedness that you did to my father David. Therefore the Lord will return your wickedness upon your own head. But King Solomon shall be blessed and the throne of David shall be established by the Lord forever. And so the king commanded again his new head of the army that he go out and strike this die, and he died. And then we read, thus the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Uh, Shammai guy was a descendant of Saul's. You might remember if you've been with us. When David was chased out of town as an old man by his son Absalom, it was Shammai that ran up and down the, the other side of the, of the hills yelling at him, you're getting what you deserve, you're a jerk, you know, you're, uh, God's getting even for my family and for Saul and all. And, and David said, just let him be, you know, just he's barking like crazy. And, and, and he even said to Shammai, I won't kill you, and he didn't. He just had someone else do it. So on his deathbed, uh, on his deathbed back in chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, David said to his son, this is some unfinished business. But notice the, the mercy. He said, just stay in town. Build a house in Jerusalem. Don't leave from there. You know, or you're writing your own death certificate. They all agreed. This wasn't vindictive. And this isn't Western culture. I know you read this and you go, oh my gosh. Well, this isn't Western culture. Every man killed was a threat to Solomon's kingship. They had shown themselves anti-God, if you will, in the terms of, of standing against that which God had established. There's a scripture in Proverbs 25 that says, if you take away the wicked from before the king, his throne can be established in righteousness. And, and it really was God removing those who were, were you know, wickedly and underhandedly standing in the way. A year prior to chapter three, where we're at now, Solomon had married a woman named Namah. And she was a woman from the Amorite, uh, Ammonites, I should say. She was going to bear him a son. His name would be called Rehoboam. Real important that you write it down somewhere because he's going to play this huge part when we get to the end of Solomon's life in the division of the kingdom. So uh, it's this boy that will, 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 will show up again and, and we'll see him uh, you know, as we go. But for the most part, when, when the kingdom split, he's going to come and kind of take center stage. Now, a year later, verse 1, Solomon makes a treaty with the Pharaoh in Egypt and marries his daughter, brings her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the walls that were all around Jerusalem. So now he marries Pharaoh's daughter. Now, that might seem odd to you considering the history of the nation and theirs. You should know that it is a very typical 
heathen practice that you find in the Old Testament, that if you make negotiations with folks, oftentimes those political alliances are, are sealed and signed with marriages. Um, Solomon, I should just point out to you, is already on the road to spiritual failure. He's going to be marrying lots of women. You think his dad was bad? Oh, Solomon perfects this craft. And it is a trait that he learned from his father. But understand it is a trait that was in the law of God absolutely forbidden. If you go read Deuteronomy chapter 17, which isn't it interesting when God gave the law to Israel, part of that law was what should you do when you get a king? And when that king comes to power, what should he do? What rules should he follow? And there are a few written there in Deuteronomy 17. One is when he comes to be the, the one that God chooses and, and he makes himself king, then A, you shouldn't go to Egypt to multiply horses for your strength because God will be your strength. Number two, you don't have to worry about collecting gold in your kingdom or be as rich as you want because God will provide all that you need. And the third of those three things was don't multiply wives to yourself really speaking to this whole political alliance thing. Don't do that. We're different. We're God's people. We don't walk by those rules. In fact, part of that verse in chapter 17, verse 17 of Deuteronomy, it said, don't multiply wives to yourselves because they will turn your heart away and don't multiply gold and don't multiply silver and don't be looking for horses. Trust the Lord. That was his direction. And the final direction was let him write a whole copy of the law himself. In other words, all that God had promised, let him write it out in his, whole, in his own writing. Let him have a book that he'd written so that he could go through it word for word and, and, and you know, take it into his heart. Let, let him be a man after God's own heart. Verse 2 tells us, meanwhile, so there's at least two wives. <laughs> the people began to sacrifice at the high places because there was no house yet built for the name of the Lord uh, until those days. And Solomon loved the Lord. He walked in the statues of his father David, except he sacrificed and he burned incense in the high places. Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was where the, high, the great high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings there upon that altar. Significant in respect to worship of Israel and of Solomon is this high places thing. Because we're going to read, in fact we will have read, that God forbid his people from going to the high places for worship. And the reason was that's where the idolaters worshiped. They tried to build the high places as high as they could. It was kind of like the ziggurat that would reach heaven. The higher we go, the closer to God we get. It was just religious fool, you know, foolery, if you will. And God didn't want that. He wouldn't want the people having that relationship with him. They could, they could worship where he'd established. But yet in this transitional period, uh, where the ark is now in Jerusalem, but it's sitting in a tent. Um, there isn't really a place of worship yet established, much anyway. Um, we, we find Solomon and we find the people going there to worship. But I want you to notice verse 3. In Solomon's heart was a love for God. This was doing the wrong thing with the right heart. This was, this, this was pursuing a, a, a practice that was real traditional in his days, but yet was not really acceptable to the Lord. And when the temple is finished and available, these high places should be put away, but we will find that by habit, these people will continue for years and years to go to these high places, but the more and more prophets that come, the more and more clear it becomes to God's people. He doesn't want them there. But I just wanted to point out the difference here because the heart was right, the place was not. And yet God knows your heart. I know sometimes we, you know, we get mad at people and go, man, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not the Lord. But yet their heart is absolutely good. God has a way of just being really patient with us. You know, you just, all right, you're doing the wrong thing, but you're doing it with the right heart. I think if, if, if you had to ask God, you want right action or right heart, he'll pick right heart every time. Now he wants both. And I'm not saying I, I have a good heart, so I'll do whatever I want. Because you, you've just belied the fact you don't have a good heart. But, but Solomon, look, look what he put into this worship. A thousand burnt offerings. I mean, my goodness, that would almost be overkill, wasn't it? But, but the only drawback was that it was the wrong place. His heart was right. His sacrifice was right. His consecration, because burnt offerings were, were the consecration of your life to the Lord. He was constantly there as a 20-year-old, 19, 20-year-old kid going, Lord, I just want to worship you. 
And, and he went where all the people went to worship. It is just a place that you and I know, and it was just like getting married to all these women, God had said to do otherwise. So these are faulty and, 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 and flawed and sinful people, just like us, that God is gonna use and continues to use and that should give you a hope, <laughs> and it gives me a hope as well. So, uh, I want you to notice that love drove him there to give. A and he gave far more than most people. He just, love and giving, verse three and five, four just went together. In love he gave, and isn't that how you give? If you can't give to the Lord with love, don't give at all, he doesn't need it. It's not like the Lord's at home ringing you know, his hands going, man, I hope they come through on the offering. No, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? The best we can do is give out of love. If you're married or you're dating or, um, you know, or you, you like someone who doesn't even know they like you, you're usually giving to them. Well, I got this for you. I was just thinking of you. There's always, love motivates to give. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So at least early on, the picture of Solomon is he made some pretty bad choices with Marriage, he had a really bad example with his father. And he shows up at the wrong place to worship, but he does so with a loving heart that God, at least at this point, doesn't complain about. He doesn't, he doesn't um, correct, if you will. We read in verse five, in fact, that there at that place of worship in Gibeon, the Lord one night or one day appeared to Solomon well, at night in a dream, and he said, ask what shall I give you? Now imagine if you are Solomon at 19 years old and you're in charge of this, this beautiful and, and, and well-established and powerful country that David left him and the Lord comes to you and you've been offering sacrifice and giving in your love and the Lord shows up and he goes, what do you want from me? What's on your list? Well, if, if you're that person, what do you ask for? What's the first thing out of your mouth? I want. Well, what do I really want? It's like the guy says, I'll give you a wish, what do you want? I want three more wishes, I guess. That'd be maybe the answer, I don't know. What do you want me to give you? An honest heart answer, I guess, reveals a heart. And Solomon longed at 20 years old to please the Lord. He longed to do the right thing. He longed to honor his father. He longed to serve God's people. He wanted God's blessing. There wasn't anything in Solomon, the 19 or 20 year old kid's heart, that was anything about self or, or gain or power or, or, or anything with Solomon. He just wanted to do the right thing. So with all the flaws that we read, and like I said, you don't read about them in Second Chronicles, but with all of the flaws that God shows us here, here's a young man who is challenged with the responsibility. It seems overwhelming, it's daunting, but he will say to the Lord, I just want to serve your people like my dad did. <laughs> I just want to be a good servant of God. So. What is it that I can give you? Solomon answers in verse six. You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked with you in truth, in righteousness and uprightness of heart. You have continued this great kindness for him. You've given him a son to sit on the throne as it is this day. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David. But I'm a little child, 19, 20. I don't know how to come out or to go in. That's pretty amazing to find that kind of humility in a teenager, right? And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you've chosen, a great people too num numerous to be counted or to be numbered. Therefore, here's what I want. Give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I might discern between good and evil who is, who is able to judge this great people of yours. For who is? I, I just want to be able to do the job. Solomon's request is amazing, right? Young man, I want you to bless me like you've blessed my dad. I, I want to know what to do. I'm, a, like, I'm like a kid. I, this is way too much for me. This is way over my head. I, I don't want to stumble. I want to be teachable. I want to stay dependent. You know, you, you know how when you get saved, everything you want, you go to the Lord with? And then sometimes you grow out of your, your clothes of grace. You know, the grace clothes, you'll grow out of them, you start to wear your, I can do it kind of stuff. This is a beautiful picture of, of, of a beginning relationship with God. It's an awesome prayer. It's an awesome picture. 
I'm so impressed with Solomon. What a kid. What a young man, you know, how great he could be. Well, the Lord, verse 10, the speech pleased the Lord. I would think so. And Solomon, that he had asked this thing, and God said to him, because you have asked this thing, you haven't asked for long life for yourself, you haven't asked for riches for yourself, you haven't, uh, nor have you asked the life of your enemies, but you have asked for just uh, discernment and understanding to, to, to be able to discern justice. Be, behold, I've given according to your word. See, I'll give you a heart and an understanding heart that there's no one that's ever been like that before you, nor shall there be anyone after you will arise any wiser than you. And I've given you what you haven't asked you. I'm going to give you riches and honor so that there won't be anyone like you among all the kings all of the day. So if you will just walk in my ways, if you'll keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. He went to Jerusalem. And interestingly enough, he stood before the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence was, and he began to offer his burnt offerings there, offering peace offerings and making a feast for all of his servants. God's response to Solomon's prayer came very quickly, right? And with great pleasure, according to verse 10. You've asked for nothing for yourself, riches, long life, victory over your enemies, because all you've asked for is wisdom to, to rule. I'll give you it all. You can have all of it if you'll just walk in my ways, keep me first. I mean, he was doing that in his prayer. I will lengthen your days, but you have to walk in my ways. And then we read in verse 12, amazingly, that God gives to Solomon a wisdom that is surpassed by no one. Other than the Lord himself, no one was ever smarter than Solomon before or after. Go look, you won't find anyone. He is the wisest man that ever lived. God gave him a gift. He wrote the book of Proverbs, much of it, the book of Ecclesiastes, um, but this promise of his wisdom was not conditional. The condition was long life and all, but this promise was not. I'm just going to make you the wisest guy ever. In fact, it's done. It didn't depend on anything. It was a gift from God. Now, here's the problem. Even if you're as smart as, and wise as Solomon, if you don't take heed to the counsel of God, you can be the smartest guy and go the wrong way. He was smart in the ways of God. He had the right answers. He knew the right understanding. He knew the heart of God. And yet for years after his, at the end of his life, he went in another direction. In fact, the whole book of Ecclesiastes is Solomon's quest later on in life to try to find life outside of the boundaries of God's word, wherever he could look. Money, sex, power, gathering of things, collections. He looked everywhere to find life apart from God. Now, he knew better. But knowing better and following it is, is kind of two different things, isn't it? You have to obey to find life. Now, tonight, you know a lot of things biblically. But if you're not obeying it, I don't care if your head is filled with information that is absolutely right, does you no good. It doesn't help you. It just makes you more responsible <laughs> for what you're not doing. It just makes your sin all the more careless and serious. So... I want to point that out to you because Solomon walked away from this time with the Lord early on being given the greatest gift of all in terms of wisdom that a man could ask for. He was equipped to do everything well. All he had to do was obey and, 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 and place his heart there. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God will add everything to you. That's exactly what he promised this man. So the conditional promises for this young man had to do with length of days and, and, and all um, but, but the wisdom came as a gift. So Solomon wakes up, verse 15. He, he, he realizes he just had a visit from God. He immediately headed for Jerusalem and for the ark, which his father had set up. He went there to offer offerings of consecration and communion. He made a feast for all of his servants. He told them all about what God had done. He would be wiser than everyone. Well, the rest of the chapter then gives him one instance whereby he can know that when God said, I'll make you wiser than anyone, he has. We read in verse 16, two women who were both prostitutes, harlots, came to the king, stood before him, and one woman said, oh, my Lord, this woman and I, we live in the same house, we gave birth 
while, uh, and I gave birth while she was in the house, and then it happened the third day that after I gave birth that she also gave birth, and we're together so that no one's with us in the house except the two of us. And this woman's son died in the night because she laid upon him. So she got up, got up in the middle of the night, she took my son from her side while I was asleep and laid in her bosom and, and laid her dead child in mine. And when I rose in the morning to nurse my son, he was dead. But I examined him in the morning and, and I knew this wasn't my son in whom I, whom I had born. And so the other woman said, no, but the living one is my son, the dead one is hers. And the first woman said, no, the dead one's your son, the living one's mine. There sits Solomon. And Solomon said, the one says, uh, this is my son who lives and your son is the dead one. The other says, no, but your son is the dead one. The other one's alive. Okay, am I getting this right? Yes. Okay, then king said, all right, then bring me a sword. And they brought a sword to the king and he said, I want you to divide the living child in half. Give half to one and half to the other. And the woman whose son was living spoke to the king. She yearned with compassion for her son. And she said, oh, my Lord, give her the living child. By no means kill him. But the other said, that sounds like a good idea. Cut him in half. <laughs> and so the king said, well, we know whose is whose. And all of Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered, verse 28. And they feared the king. They saw that he had the wisdom of God in him to administer justice. So pretty difficult spot to be in. If you're a parent and you've had to referee kids' stories, or you're a pastor and you've had to sit through marriage counseling, you'll appreciate the wisdom of Solomon. The he said, she said, no, I didn't, yes, I did. My mother and, uh, and father, my sister and I used to argue a lot about, you know, who got the bigger piece of the pie or whatever. You got more, she got more than I did. My father finally said, I'll tell you what, one of you cut the cake and the other one gets to choose which piece he wants. And then you're out there with like a micrometer, like, you know, sunrise. It really did solve the problem, you know? So I guess that's a pretty good, wise way to go, good idea. Well, the outcome was obviously God gave Solomon great wisdom. He flushed out who was who, um, the liar and the truth teller. But more importantly, in verse 28, he was established in the eyes of the people for his wisdom. The wisdom of God was in the life of Solomon. And like I said, one of the lessons I think you can learn from Solomon is no matter how much wisdom you get from the Lord, and I, I really think if you live in the U.S. and you've been a Christian for a while, and you go to church regularly that's teaching the Bible, you know a lot <laughs> about the heart of God. You know a lot. So it can lead to sac uh, sadness, though, and lack of fruitfulness if you don't put it into practice. Chapter four, and this one will go five. So watch this now. Here's what we're going to do. So Solomon was king over all of Israel. This is an overview chapter that God gives to us to just give to us out of kind of, I won't say in chronological context, just kind of a, an overview of Solomon's kingdom, his administration, and the wisdom that God gave him. It's just a big picture that stands, you know, a mile back and looks at what's going on. In verses one through verse six, Solomon in his wisdom from the Lord developed a large oversight committee where he began to delegate responsibilities to people. It's certainly a great way to oversee many things. If you can work with your delegates, people that you trust, that you can you know, delegate responsibilities to, these men had access to Solomon, but they took care of a lot of things. His prime minister, in verse 2, was a fellow named Azariah. He was the son of Zayak. He was a priest, but apparently he was the head of the officials. Following that in those verses are 11 other names of those in places of authority and, and uh, responsibility that were just directly responsible to Solomon. Following that, verses 7 through 19, see what I'm doing here? Solomon gives to us then a list of 12 governors from geographical areas that were given the responsibility to bring food and supplies for the king and his household one month out of the year. 12 governors, 12 months, 12 supplies. I should just point out to you that our reading quickly, verse 8, there is the name Ben-Hur. You didn't think it was in the Bible? Look. It's not the same as the movie, but there is, 
Ben-Hur. Verse 20, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sands of the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. So Solomon reigned over all of the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines, or if you will, from the Euphrates, way south to the borders of Egypt. And they brought tribute and they served Solomon all the days of his life. The extent and the prosperity of Solomon's rule as a young man under God's leadership is, is laid out. And at, in each one of these positions of, of extension of the kingdom, you will read the, the taxation and the subjugation of the people under Solomon's reign. Now here we're given some interesting statistics. Verse 22, Solomon's provisions for one day were 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meat, 10 fatted uh, oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, 100 sheep besides the deer, the gazelle, the roebucks, and the fatted fowl. That's for his house every day. 30 measures of fine flour. By the way, a, a core weighed about 650 pounds. So you can imagine how many people that were there. He, he gave them 10 fatted oxen, prime beef, 20 commercial grade beef, 100 sheep every day, wild venison, turkey, chickens, at two pounds per person per day. This figures out to 30,000 people in his government. 30,000. That's how big this bureaucracy had gotten. Can't you wait for the Lord to come back and rule? I think our government is bigger, but <laughs> you see how quickly this goes. Verse 24, he had dominion over all of the region on this side of the river from Pishkah even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river. He had peace on, on all sides round about him and Israel and Judah dwelt safely, every man under his vineyard and his fig tree from Dan as far as uh, to Beersheba, in other words, from the north to the south throughout all of Solomon's uh, rule. Solomon had 40,000 stalls for his horses. Remember what we said about that? 12,000 horsemen. And these governors, all men in his month, provided food for the king and for all who came to Solomon's table so that there was never a lack in supplies. They also brought barley and straws in the proper place for the horses, for the steeds. Every man has a charge and God gave to Solomon wisdom exceedingly great understanding and a largeness of heart like the sand of the seashore. So God put his hand upon Solomon's life. The, the real point was that Israel under Solomon reached the zenith of their blessings, their prosperity, even their borders. It, this is about as close to, as you can get to the borders that God promised Abraham one day that his people would occupy. It will be fully satisfied only when Jesus comes. And when he comes to rule upon the earth, in fact, he's going to go well beyond that. Then he's just going to take over the whole place. And you're going to come and rule with him. So great wisdom, national unity, peace, prosperity, uh, all from the hand of God as one guy sits on the throne filled with the wisdom of God. I always pray for our president and for anybody that would be president that God will just give them wisdom. Because wisdom from God upon the leaders can bless the people. And, and at least, and, and this was in, in the life of a man that at least for many years didn't really walk with God, but God watched over his people nonetheless. Um, Solomon's wisdom then is, is laid out for us here towards the end of the chapters. We read in verse 29 about the wisdom, the understanding, and the, and the largeness of his heart. A real compassionate man. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of every man in Egypt for, and from the east he was wiser than all, from Ethan to Heman to all these guys we don't know. His name was, in all of the surrounding areas, he wrote 3,000 Proverbs. He wrote 1,005 Psalms. He spoke about trees from the cedar tree in Lebanon to the hyssop and the springs out of the, hall of the wall. He spoke about animals and birds and creeping things and fish. And men of all nations from all kingdoms of the earth who heard about his wisdom, they would come just to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So Solomon, in his wisdom, you know, was good at administration. He was good at the arts. He was good as a lyricist. He was good as a poet. He was a student of life sciences. 
He was greatly wise, had great potential. Unfortunately, with all of that given to him, <laughs> if you don't obey, you're just fooling yourself. Now look, here's, here's the good news. From a spiritual perspective, you have all that wisdom tonight. You know, God's spirit has come to live in you. So everything you need for life and godliness, God has already provided. You might have to study your Bible. You might have to pray a little harder. You may have to, you know, get counsel, a multitude of counselors, there's wisdom. But, but God has provided that wisdom for you. But you're gonna have to use it. In the next four verses, chapters or so, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, maybe those chapters, we are gonna be given from the Lord a, an outline of the temple and all. We're gonna pick up the pace a little bit. I'm gonna bring you some overheads next week to show you what he was building. And then the following weeks, we're gonna make you a list of every king and ruler and overseer because Solomon is about to die, just 12 chapters from now. And we're gonna go into this divided kingdom and man, there's a lot to learn. And I hope you're ready for it and that you'll stick with it and see it through and take lots of notes because um, I think I said to you last week, if you know this portion of history, these 40 years, and then what follows, all of the Old Testament from here to book of Matthew will fall into these next couple of hundred years. It'll just fit together like a glove and you'll, your Bible will get smaller and you'll get wiser and you'll be able to apply the things that you're learning there. But for now, young man, you know, he's already making some mistakes like most folks do when they're younger. Well, it doesn't really, older too, I guess. But especially when you're young. He, he, but he had a heart for the Lord like few people I have. But God blessed him. Overlooked his faults, overlooked his stumbles. Uh, unfortunately, when you have the wisdom, you gotta use it. If you don't use it, look, you came to church tonight, what did you learn? Then go use that. Mark a verse, circle a word. Man, let the Lord, you know, take him home with you in the words that he has spoken to you. I, I, I really believe when we come to church every week, God's here to teach us, right? He walks up and down the aisles. He puts his arms around us. He, he opens our understanding that we might know him. So that's our prayer. You're certainly not going to get anything walking around going, well, that's what Pastor Jack said. Please don't do that. But, but, but quote God's word. Let, let that be your hope. Amen? Father, thank you tonight for getting us through this evening. And, and we do pray for our country that you would protect us from this virus that's running rampant, that is, is producing what seems to be a mass hysteria. And yet it's serious and we want to take it seriously. So may we do our part. May we be washing our hands and, and maybe not hugging so much and being, being a little careful, not shaking hands so often. May we just kind of be careful. But Lord, may you allow us to continue to meet as a church in person, <laughs> wonderfully together. May you protect us. May you protect our country. May you protect our, our president and those who are in charge now of, of seeing this thing through. It seems very drastic. The, the stock market just falling apart. But Lord, we know you're the Lord and nothing escapes your understanding, your, 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 your interest. You knew this was coming. We just need to look to you. So we'll do our part, we'll be practical and, and we'll be spiritual. We're gonna pray, God, that, that you said no weapon formed against us shall perish. That, that we can look and, and there will be those that fall to the right and to the left, but they won't come near us, not near our dwelling, not near our land. So we pray for your hand upon us as we, as we get on our knees, as we cry out your name, as we lift up our hands. Maybe this will bring our country back to its knees. And if that's the case, Lord, we pray that for that. Restore us, revive us. Bring revival to our country as we look to you. This is, a, this is an enemy we can't see, we can't defend against, it, at least it, for now. And yet, <laughs> we're still at rest because we have a God who loves us and can watch over us. May God bless you guys this week. Pray for Daniel as he starts in that new position of a pastor now and with it comes great responsibility and that the Lord would keep him. Pray for this next uh, couple of weeks as we plan for Easter that the Lord, if he wants, would keep that door open. We'll let you know, but either way, just pray. God, have your way. He's bigger than everyone. <laughs> I love to go to the top. Go to him. And tonight, if you have needs, we'd love to pray with you. Their pastors will be up front. We would love to just agree with you in prayer. So don't fret. Be at peace. Rest in him. 
he knows what he's doing. And may we be an example to the world of the peace that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name. Shall we stand?